Hi guys, thank you for joining me again on the foreshore here. It's a rainy old day in London town. I am about three hours ahead of low tide, so we'll have a nice long time out here. And there are a couple of things I'm really looking for, and that is oyster shells to replenish my stock of shells that I paint on. And the other thing is tin glazed ware. And that is because I'm doing a pottery special called Pottery Pieces. I'm just filming that now and the first one, it's going to be a series, the first one is going to be about tin glazed ware. Okay, look out for that and for the time being, let's get stuck into mudlarking. Now the first thing that's caught my eye is this fragment of salt glazed stoneware. This piece was once part of the neck, and it's the very top of the neck, as you can see here. It also has a little detail which suggests it's probably a Bartman jug fragment. The second thing I noticed is a Roman tegula fragment, and quite a good chunk at that. A tegula is a roof tile, one half of the tegula and imbrex roofing system, used both in ancient Greece, who first used the system, and Roman architecture. The tegula, a fragment of which I have here, was the flat, plain tile with raised edges that was laid upon a roof ready for the imbrex, a half pipe, semi-cylindrical, to be laid over the top of the edges of the tegula joints, covering the small space in between. Using this design had two main features. It was both durable and waterproof. When well made and properly applied, there was little reason for further waterproofing. This innovative concept is still in use today as an international feature of style and design. It is known as imbrication, which is the term used to refer to the arrangement of items in overlapping layers. Turned up a nice metal spot here, so I'm just going to have a good look through and see if we can find any goodies. You see, there's pins. As I say, as I always say, a good sign. So we'll look through here, look more pins, and see if anything extraordinary turns up. We've got some lovely little bits and pieces down here. I mean, nothing whole, but these pieces of lead, decorated lead, um, all a good sign. Okay, don't get too excited. It's not a gold uh, arm bracelet. And actually it probably isn't even that extraordinary. It looks like it might be a cable tie or some kind of tie for items but what I do like about it is that it might have some information on there we go and it might have a company name but it might just say have numbers of what it was tying up I'm just gonna give this a wash and we'll have a closer look Well, there we are. You know how I like a serendipitous find. I wasn't even gonna to come to this area today. I was doing a bit of oyster shell hunting and then I saw this patch has been uncovered for the first time in ages. Now, here we go. British Railways 46615. Hmm, 12 to 43. I contacted a friend who was very much in the know about British Railways, coming from a family of train people. He reliably informs me that although we don't know exactly what this piece of mysterious railway honour was attached to, the SR on the back indicates the southern region of the five British Railways regions. One idea about where this tag may have been located was to a brute. That is British Railways universal trolley equipment. As my friend says, everything on the railway has a number, so it could be the number of the brute. Who knows, but I love this little embossed tag and will certainly be keeping it as a little bit of British Railways treasure. Okay, well here's a strange little find. It looks like 
it was part of a toy, perhaps part of a propeller, maybe from a plane, little lead find, not sure. There we are though, little sweet thing. Now to give you some idea of how long I've waited for this little area to get back to how it once was, I'd say it's been, ooh, about three years. So, you need some patience. I've just spotted something in this little pool. I'm gonna use my pointer to show you. I'm not sure if you can see it there. So just behind it, there's a bit of lead type. There's a little stud that ever so oh. They are so tiny. There. So I think I'll carry on in this spot just for a few minutes longer and then head over somewhere else. You see we've got modern nuts and bolts and things here as well. Well, I hope you can hear me because the wind is blasting. I'm sort of hiding under my coat, but I've just spotted something that I was hoping for, um, this little patch here, I'm just going to show you. I mentioned hasn't been uncovered in a while, I've found a lot of good stuff here and I'm glad it's uh, out in the open again. Right, the eagle-eyed among you will be able to see it right now. I'm going to just get closer to it and see if you can spot it. Of course you can. Here it is. Ah, oh, wow. It's a goodie. Brilliant. Now that is a super find. Let's give that. By the way, when I say it's a super find, I'm not praising myself there. I'm just saying. I'm really glad I found it. Okay. Let's uh, go and wash this off. I wasn't expecting it to be quite so decorated. Okay, let's wash it off and check out what we've got here. Okay guys, here it is. Gresham Club. And the button is made by Fermin of London, so I'm guessing this is Victorian going into Edwardian. It might not have great age to it. But uh, that's a lovely find. And here comes some more information about it. Founded in 1843, this gentleman's social club was named after the Elizabethan Thomas Gresham, who was an English merchant and financier and founded the Royal Exchange. Its members were, according to Charles Dickens Jr., merchants, bankers and gentlemen of known respectability, no candidate eligible until he has reached the age of 21. Election by ballot, one black ball in ten shall exclude. Its clubhouse was at 1 King William Street, on the corner of St Swithin's Lane, a purpose-built premises, the architect was Henry Flower, and on the first day of construction, a celebratory dinner was held at the Albion Tavern, attended by Sir William Magne, Lord Mayor of London. Although the club disbanded in 1991, it was resurrected in 2018 by three former members of the London Capital Club. Its ethos is, and I quote, a private members club for professional gentlefolk, stimulating social and business interaction amongst like-minded members and their guests. The club is no longer a gentleman-only club and has a diverse membership of which 20% are women. I wonder, does the finding of this button make me an honorary Gresham's Club member or perhaps one of its staff? I haven't been able to find many other examples of this button online despite it being made by Furman, one of the largest button manufacturers of its day. I've contacted the Gresham Club for more information and, of course, will update you with any exciting news. That's a strange thing. Plate with some writing. Hmm, so obviously someone's written on this. I wonder if this was a plate where they write bad stuff about themselves and they smash it. 
dispel it. Something, myself, who I, something, something. Right, that's what my guess is. We'll look this up and then I'll let you know more. Oh, oh, there's a heart in there. Maybe it was a nice thing. Oh dear. Here is the tide just washed up. This little piece of green glaze. So that's a gorgeous piece of pottery. With a lovely green glaze on there. You might recall a few weeks ago I found and took home a large piece of roof pantile. Well, I've been doing a little more research on pantiles in general, as I also keep finding fragments with what appears to be maker's marks. As you can see, this tile here has an initial letter pressed into it, an H. This letter design looks relatively modern. However, I have got another at home, initialed with a P in an old style character, and I'm sure that one has a bit of age to it. So what do these letters represent? Luckily, I've grown accustomed to solving niche mysteries that mudlarking often throws up, and I knew just who to ask. The Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Now, they didn't have the answer, but they knew a couple of men who did. Enter Adam Spicer of Spicer's Handmade Tiles and George Monteith of Tudor Tiles, both traditional handmade tile makers in Kent. Adam and George are two of a small number of true tile makers left in the UK who continue to craft their tiles by hand. They are both in agreement that the initials I keep finding pressed into the pan tiles are either maker's marks or area marks and are most likely French or Dutch. Adam and George also shared another little fact that I didn't know. In the 17th century, pan tiles were used as ballast in ships from the Low Countries to the Isles, and that is how they first ended up in the UK. In places such as Fife and Suffolk, the left-behind ballast was snaffled up and used by enterprising locals and craftspeople, and, as George says, that's how the story of pan tiles goes. Let's take a look. 18th century pipe bowl, fragment as it's broken. Um, obviously it's broken from the pipe anyway, but there's a bit of a bowl that you can see inside it here. I'm not sure if you can make out. Down there, there you are, you can see the hole where the smoke would travel through. Very thin coal. This did have some maker's marks on it at one point. Very worn down, that looks like a W perhaps. And maybe an H, WH. Anyway, I'll leave this here for someone else to find. I'll leave it disappointing side up just in case. And then just here is a tiny piece of tin glaze. It's tin glazed pottery and it's glazed on both sides. And this tin glaze has a little tin oxide mixed into the glaze. There were other oxides used to create these colours. Metallics were used, such as cobalt, to create blues, 
But this was a really popular pottery type that mimicked porcelain wares that were really hard to get. Only the very wealthiest had those. So anyway, there's a tiny piece. And I've just spotted something else here that is really tiny. I'm not going to take it, but it's the tip of a sugar crusher there. It's got a little bit of decoration around the edge that you can see there. But I'll be leaving this one here for someone else. Stoneware fragment. That's nice to see a cross section of stoneware there. Pottery. There, salt glaze the stoneware, but I say it's nice because I love this glaze gradient. That's very pretty. In this zone here, where there's a lot of really sea worn, Thames worn fragments, lots of bone, shells, that kind of thing. And I've just noticed this piece here, which is interesting. It's pretty rough, with some really chunky inclusions. So I'm going to take that piece home with me and find out a little more about it. I've just spotted something exciting down the way and keep your fingers crossed for me remember how I said I'm looking for tin glaze stuff today well here we go I better get down there to find it I've just come up here to get my bag now let's head back down to the waterline and see if I can get this thing and see how good it is okay it's down there and let's see what it is. Okay, I'm battling with the wind, so let's head to a voiceover. This large piece of tin glazed earthenware is part of a lid, probably from a posset pot or something similar. We can see by the finial, which shows to be missing an additional piece, the tip, that it would have been quite an elaborate, fancy piece, perhaps like the examples on the screen now. English Delftware, tin glazed wares that were made in England, date from the 1550s to the late 18th century. Small Delftware fragments are fairly common finds on the Thames, but larger pieces like this don't turn up as frequently, so it's safe to say that I'm very pleased with this piece here. Give that a wash.
guys well it is that time of day again it's time to say goodbye for now and thank you for joining me on this epic mudlarking adventure today i've had such a time my bag is absolutely full with various large chunks of ceramics i've got that really beautiful gresham's button and a whole load of tin blades wear so that's great Thanks as ever for watching and joining me down on the foreshore and I'll see you again in another couple of weeks.